Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is March 6th, 2014, and my guest is Jeffrey Sachs of Columbia University. Jeff, welcome back to Econ Talk. Great to be with you, Russ. Thanks a lot. Our topic for today is poverty and the Millennium Villages Project, your ambitious effort to reduce poverty in some of the poorest parts of the world and ideally to become a model for much wider efforts. I want to start with just the basic idea behind the Millennium Villages Project. Uh, What makes it different from other aid projects? The idea is to achieve the Millennium Development Goals. So it is a Explain what those are and where they come from. Absolutely. In September 2000, the member states of the UN, the world's governments, agreed on eight uh, development objectives for the period 2000 to 2015 to fight poverty and hunger, to get kids in school, to promote gender equality, to reduce maternal and child mortality, to fight diseases like AIDS and malaria, to ensure access to safe drinking water and sanitation, uh, and to uh, enable poor countries to uh, take up new technologies, especially information technologies, uh, and to have a, an effective partnership with the, with the rest of the world. So the purpose of the Millennium Villages Project is to actually uh, help these uh, very poor communities, uh, 10 main sites uh, in 10 countries in Africa. And now, because of the interest uh, in expanding number of places around Africa to achieve the Millennium Development Goals and to learn from that experience of new approaches to fighting hunger, poverty, disease, uh, illiteracy, and the other problems of extremely poor communities. And what's the idea behind the Millennium Villages Project in in terms of what makes them different? Well, the idea is an integrated strategy that is goal-based. And the goals are very clear. Reduce child mortality, for example, by two-thirds compared to the baseline so that one can uh, see uh, children surviving and getting on with normal lives to get kids in school. Uh, to reduce malaria and so forth. So the goal orientation uh, is is an approach to uh, work in this area that I find very important and powerful. Uh, you measure, uh, you uh, think about uh, the things that can be done to accomplish these goals. Uh, you uh, do uh, various uh, strategies and, and brainstorm. Uh, these are all being done at the local level, of course. Uh, measure again, uh, continue to learn. And of course, this project uh, will be completed uh, with the Millennium Development Goal timetable next year, and we'll see uh, see how we've done. Uh, and that's uh, the nature of the project. One of the things that's quite different uh, in this project from others is that it's an integrated uh, strategy. It covers agriculture, health, education, infrastructure, and uh, this kind of uh, integrated development uh, lost favor with a lot of people. And indeed, when uh, we started this project, lots of people uh, stood up and said, ah, this is impossible. This failed in the past. Uh, Integrated rural development. Well, it is an integrated rural development strategy, and I think it uh, is uh, going to Uh, show a way forward that is very important for rural areas uh, across Africa. Let's talk about integrated development uh, more generally uh, as an approach to to, uh, ending poverty. Uh, What's what's the idea rather than, say, an alternative approach would be to focus on a particular problem? Why is it important to go across the board and what are you trying to achieve? I I think there are two basic uh, reasons. One is that people care about various things in their lives. They would like uh, kids to be in school, but they'd also like their kids not to be dying of malaria. Uh, They would uh, like uh, the kids uh, to uh, be vaccinated, but also to have enough to eat. Uh, So 
people have uh, many objectives that are pretty fundamental in meeting their basic needs of uh, having enough food and income security and access to uh, health care and so forth. So you want to do a, a number of things when you start uh, in a place that where basic needs are not met. The second reason is the uh, good sense that there are synergies, uh, that it will be helpful in a community also not only to uh, work on agriculture, but also to work on malaria control so that the community uh, isn't sick with malaria when it's harvest time, uh, or not only to work on uh, helping to ensure that there are enough classrooms and trained teachers, but also that the kids aren't sick all the time with uh, worm infections and so on. So there are obvious synergies that have been noted for decades and decades. And the idea is that by working across a number of different areas, it is possible to make better, more effective, lower cost, more uh, resilient and reliable progress on any one single objective. Uh, and there's lots of uh, evidence uh, of many, many kinds, say, on controlling worm infections as a way to improve school performance. And so the linkages are strong uh, across these various sectors. The, the knock on uh, this kind of strategy in the past has been that it's too complicated. Uh, and part of the uh, Millennium Village project uh, is to test that proposition. My view is it's not too complicated. My view is that it is possible for a community, a district, uh, to uh, have uh, strategies on agriculture, on water and sanitation, on uh, electricity, uh, on uh, uh, health care, uh, because there's a division of labor uh, in local government. There's a division of labor uh, even uh, at the village level. And there's no reason, it seems to me, to think that it's not possible to make progress on a variety of interconnected fronts. Well, as my, as, as my listeners know, I'm, I'm somewhat skeptical of, of the um, simplicity of that approach, whether, whether, it, whether it works or not. We'll get to that, I hope, uh, a little later on. But I want to cite something in support of the integrated approach, which is uh, I did a, podca a podcast episode of Econ Talk with Paul Tuff on how children succeed, and he discusses at length uh, uh, Jeffrey Canada of the Harlem Children's Zone, which has taken a similar approach to uh, poverty and the challenges of, of poor children in the United States, particularly in the urban setting of New York City. He appears to have been quite successful. Uh, it is very expensive. Uh, that would be one thing to say about it. The second is, is that he, of course, is uh, – uh, an American, and he knows something about the people he's trying to help. I think one of the challenges that the Millennium Village Projects received has been the attempt to try to uh, have more of a top-down approach and whether that's possible given the uh, complexity of these these different things that, that we hope to have synergies, but uh, maybe we don't understand fully the way they interact. Russ, uh, let me start by saying that uh, a lot of what uh – uh, you've apparently heard about the Millennium Village Project and what's been said about it simply is not true. So uh, this is why I'm so pleased to be with you today. Uh, this is not a top-down approach. This is an approach that says that uh, experts locally, uh, because this is all uh, African uh, development experts at the local level working in their communities, working on a variety of issues and working closely with the government and with uh, the uh, village uh, uh, communities and so forth can identify paths to uh, help with the scale up of critical uh, challenges and interventions, whether it's health or higher incomes or education and so forth. Uh, what is top down in the only sense is that uh, the globally agreed goals of fighting extreme poverty are shared goals. So in the sense that this project is aiming to reduce child mortality, maternal mortality, uh, deaths from AIDS, uh, malaria control, access to safe water and sanitation, kids in school, uh, improved agricultural production. Yes, those are shared goals. But in terms of how this is to be done, this is by... Uh, local experts working with 
globally available knowledge and technology and, and local needs, culture, uh, traditions, patterns, and ecology to find the ways forward. And uh, this project's been seriously misrepresented uh, by people who never went uh, and uh, continue to repeat all sorts of things because from the day this started, uh, there were uh, challenges that this is top down or uh, Jeff Sachs working in his office in New York, uh, giving uh, dictates and so forth. This could not be farther from the truth. Well, give me, I'll give you one example of the top-down approach that I worry about, which is one of the alternative ways to, to fight poverty, and it's not necessarily my favorite, but it's, it is a way, is simply to give people money. And it's my impression, correct me if I'm wrong, that one of the um, foundations of the projects – in most, if not all, the villages to, is to increase agricultural productivity. It's not obvious to me that that's the right thing to do. Uh, maybe there are other things people would do with their money, get into other activities, find other ways to earn income. And so that strikes me as the kind of a top-down approach I'm worried about, as well as picking what crops are the ones they should specialize in and so on. Is that not the case? Is there not it, been it, – it, It's absolutely not the case for us, uh, and uh, there are uh, – Financial institutions that have grown, they're called SACOs, uh, that to provide financing locally to all sorts of activities. Uh, it can be agricultural, non-agricultural. Uh, we have uh, in Mayanje uh, uh, significant uh, um, scaling up now of uh, carpentry and of metalworking. Uh, this is uh, what the local areas uh, are identifying as uh, their possibilities what kind of crops. Uh, this isn't dictated from outside. I saw that uh, Nina Monk uh, claimed it was, and you uh, eagerly agreed to, with her in, in your interview, but it's simply not the case. Various things are being tried by local uh, experts. Believe me, I had absolutely no idea uh, when this project started and didn't until I heard about the wonderful uh, work being done that uh, uh, silk, uh, uh, sericulture, uh, silk uh, worm uh, farming uh, could be profitable in Ethiopia. This was identified locally. Uh, we know nothing about silkworm farming here in New York City, I can tell you. Uh, yeah. And this is uh, identified by local uh, experts uh, who are trying to figure out ways to help communities make more money, earn better livelihoods. Uh, and we're having this project in a wide range of ecological zones with all sorts of different crops being produced uh, in Nigeria, soybeans, in Mali, it's rice, in Senegal, it's onions, in Ghana, it's cocoa, uh, in uh, uh, Kenya, it's uh, dairy and horticulture, in Ethiopia, it's uh, sericulture, uh, uh, in uh, Uganda, it's uh, coffee and matoke, in uh, Rwanda, it's cassava uh, and uh, carpentry. And uh, there are many, many non-agricultural activities as well as agricultural activities. These stories just circulate like uh, the urban legends, but these are rural legends of what's been said about this project. Well, I'm, I'm just looking at the annual report from 2012. It says, first paragraph, the main goal of the agriculture business development sector of the MVP is to contribute toward MDG1, which is the Millennium Development Goals, to have, have cut in half the proportion of people who suffer from hunger and live on less than a dollar a day. It says the current focus sector has been on interventions that contribute to raising incomes, including organizing farmers into Farmer-based organizations and cooperatives, increasing and sustaining agricultural productivity, strengthening agricultural monitoring, et cetera. So that, that's the kind of language that makes me think there's a big focus Russ, on agriculture. Says including, Russ, that says including. Yep. It says including Correct. those ways. It didn't say limited to those ways. And I don't – have you been to a Millennium Village yourself? I have not. H have you been to a rural Africa? I have not. Okay. I would welcome you to uh, come see – uh, you'd enjoy it, uh, and you'd see, you'd, you'd see what's really going on, uh, and uh, and I'm delighted you raise a text like that because it gives a chance to uh, to uh, ask and clarify. And part of the problem of much of the criticism is that people don't try to clarify; uh, they don't ask; uh, they just make uh, swinging uh, statements that uh, absolutely have no basis. Uh, in, Let me ask in, in you a different reality. way then. 
let me ask a different way. Do you have a feel for how much uh, non-agricultural productivity has been increased? Obviously, agriculture is important. I'm not going to suggest it's not. Uh, and there's been some spectacular increases, which is great uh, through the use of, of seed and, and fertilizer. Um is there significant non-agricultural stuff going on? It's okay if it's not. Maybe, maybe there shouldn't be. I'm just suggesting. Yeah, I, I, I actually don't know quantitatively. We won't know till we do a very detailed survey next year to find out what household income is based on, what the kinds of activities are. Uh, we see uh, lots of uh, things happening, but I, I can't give you a number. Uh, but we see lots of local finance. People are not inert, as you know very well. Uh, they're not uh, somehow uh, subscribed to this project, and that's the only thing they can do. These are real live communities. We uh, have uh, a number of advisors working, uh, local experts, all of them, no expats, uh, working, living in these communities, uh, working with the communities and with the district to identify things to do. But we actually don't know in, in any comprehensive sense what people actually are doing because they're doing all sorts of things. They're doing farming. Uh, they're doing non-farm activities. Uh, uh, a lot of uh, people uh, are working in construction or uh, seasonal uh, work, and we won't really know uh, the quantitative uh, answer to your question until next year. Uh, let's go back to some of the basics. So um – I know there's been a recent expansion in a number of countries, but originally, and, and quotes so far, if you could measure it, how much money is involved? How much money has the project uh, expended and how many people do we think it's touched? I'm trying to get some measure of the per capita uh, amounts that we're talking about here for the size of aid. One of the, your interesting and provocative claims has been that we just don't spend enough. If we'd spend enough, we we could get there. We could get over the hump. So I'm curious, uh, what do we know about how much uh, the the projects have spent so far? Yeah, the uh, core of the project is uh, ten uh, village sites in in ten countries, uh, and then around them are uh, an expansion area. We call the whole thing that core village plus the expansion area. We call those clusters. So there are ten clusters in the project and they average about 50,000 people. It varies by country. Uh, so it's about 500,000 people total uh, in uh, the area. In the first five years of the project, uh, really uh, in, I would say, depending on the site from the second to the fifth year, because there was a phase in and we didn't envision the project uh, in exactly of what scale and what size at the beginning. It depended on uh, what kind of uh, fundraising uh, was possible. Um, we reached about $60 per person in the broad cluster from years two through five. Then in the second five years, uh, from 2011 to 2015 to the conclusion next year, we're phasing out kind of on a down ramp uh, to zero uh, by the end of 2015. And that was uh, the plan that by 2015, uh, this project would end and uh, whatever responsibilities would be either individual or local community or government. And we have phased down the non uh, core village site quite substantially. Government has taken over basically all of the functions in all of the sites by now. And in the core one village per cluster, uh, we're probably at about $40 per capita, something like that right now. So uh, when when you, I don't have a, a uh, final sum of that, um, but when you think about uh, a village of say, or a community at uh, $50,000 at $60 per capita, which was the first part of the project that was the running at about $3 million a year per site. And that was, so for all 10 sites, that would be about $30 uh, million. And that would be total something like 120 million, probably uh, half of that, 
uh, in the second uh, um, phase as uh, things are ramping down and, and less than uh, that right now because we've substantially, uh, as planned, uh, cut back in the uh, non-core part of the project, handed over a lot of uh, schools and facilities uh, to the local government, and will phase out this uh, core uh, Millennium Village, we call it MV1, that's the center of uh, uh, of the project, we'll phase that uh, out in terms of direct financing by the end of next year. Does the total spent include in-kind donations from corporations, local government spending, other things? Yeah, so th- this is a very good point. Th- the whole project was based on a notion of about $120 per person per year invested in overcoming extreme poverty. And as you know, these are sites that were extremely poor in poor countries. So these were just about the poorest of the poor in each of the respective countries. $120 is a small number, but unfortunately the base is pitifully small to start well, with. It, it is an incredibly small number. And the fact that people live on a, such small amount and, and die for lack of meeting basic needs is the whole motivation of the Millennium Development Goals and the, and the purpose of this project. So we said that we would aim to have about $60 uh, of our own contributions and seek about $60 of counterpart contributions coming from government, coming from the local community itself, coming from other NGOs. Uh, and during, I would say, 2009, 2010, 2011, because it actually takes time to collect all the data and understand uh, exactly where we were, we were running something like that at about $60 from the project and about $60 from the combined contributions of government, community, and uh, NGOs and uh, local companies and so forth. The expansion, though, uh, that's coming, uh, I'm not sure when it starts or if it started already, seems to be a much larger sum of money. This United Kingdom project in Ghana, for example, is that is it more expensive, roughly the same? Uh I don't have the exact number for that one uh, project in northern Ghana, but I think it's something around uh, 90 to to $100 per capita. I don't have the exact number uh, on hand. That is uh, reflecting two things. One is the 60 was, and the whole 120, in fact, uh, was uh, based on prices of around 2005, 2006, uh, and we've had a significant spike of uh, energy prices, most importantly, but other prices as well. So uh, can, making this in real terms would be quite important. In other words, inflation adjusted. Uh, second, the site in northern Ghana is uh, in the very north of a country where the economic uh, activity is in the south of the country. So the infrastructure is very weak in the north. The transport costs very, very high. The costs of uh, inputs, construction, and so forth, uh, reflecting this uh, relative isolation in the very north of the country. That's why we're working there. Uh, And uh, so we put it at a little bit higher, but we're still looking for contributions from outside and uh, probably aiming for something around, in nominal terms, uh, around $150, $160 per capita. I don't have the exact numbers in front of me. Yeah, I'm surprised at that because there have been – Claims on the web that that there it's thousands of dollars per household. Those are not correct. Yeah, but this this is kind of uh, sorry to say it. This is really uh, an effort just to uh, confuse people. If you add, say, uh, even sixty dollars per person in a household, and then you say the average size of the household uh, is six people, so that's three hundred sixty. Uh, and then you say that, well, that's for five years, uh, so you're talking about something like $1,800, and you make a pronouncement like that. And then you say, oh, it's not really the project, but there's also the matching and so forth, as if that's all incremental. Oh, that's 3000 uh, 3600 per capita. And this is what uh, Mr. Clemens, uh, uh, Michael Clemens, uh, did at one point, and it, uh, it tries to give – an utterly distorted, hard to understand point of view 
multiply by the number of people in a household, add not what the project's giving, but what government services and so forth would be giving, multiply it over five years, announce some big headline number that nobody has a clear idea about how to interpret, and then announce, well, they're giving thousands and thousands of dollars to households. I regard that as very unhelpful and deliberately distorting, Russ. Well, I think the key question, we'll link to some of the articles pro and con on this issue of cost, but I think the the key issue here is is effectiveness. And b- before I get to some overall measures I want you to discuss, I want to talk about one smaller issue, which fascinated me. How are the projects using uh, community health workers? Because I, there seems to be some enthusiasm for that, their effectiveness, and I'm curious how they're being used. The project in general uh, is exploring many, many innovative delivery mechanisms. Once we said 60 per capita coming from the project or even less, you're in an extraordinarily tight budget. Uh, This is not uh, some gold-plated budget. This is so tight because remember, 60 bucks per capita, that's for agriculture, that's for infrastructure, that's for schools, that's for a health system. I don't think uh, most of your listeners could even imagine that. We have an $8,000 per capita health system. We're talking about squeezing all of these advantages. And then I get uh, this complaint, oh, look at how expensive this is. This, it, it, it couldn't be less and still be talking about human beings, uh, I, I have to say. We're trying to do everything possible, and I mean by we, our, uh, the communities and the wonderful African experts leading this, and then anything that we can add in the brainstorming and the technology to get as far as possible, given the absolutely uh, meager uh, budgets and extreme poverty uh, that uh, characterize the regions where these villages are located and that brought us to these places in the first place. So when you come to the question of health systems, my uh, work starting as uh, the chairman of a commission for WHO now uh, 14 years ago, the Commission on Macroeconomics and Health, and then uh, as uh, the UN's advisor on the Millennium Development Goals and my specific work uh, in uh, many of the disease control efforts on malaria and AIDS and others have uh, enabled me to make a claim, which is a a, a tough one, but I will stand by it, that it is possible even at 60 or $70 per capita, just 60 or 70 per capita to have a rudimentary but uh, life-saving primary health system in an impoverished region. Now, mind you, Given the extreme poverty in these places, the normal budget coverage is on the order of $15 per capita, not even the 60 or 70. I've claimed that if we could mobilize a bit more resources, we could help to save millions of lives, scale up core interventions, and help young children to have a future because they would grow up uh, healthy and productive and with brain development and with uh, their basic uh, health needs addressed early in life. Community health workers is one part of that strategy that I'm thrilled with in actual performance. We've worked very hard on it. The idea is to train village workers, people from the villages, typically uh, young uh, women, Uh, And some young men, though I would say predominantly young women, maybe uh, age 20 to 25, who may have uh, 10 to 12 years of of schooling. They're literate, they're numerate, uh, but they absolutely have no formal uh, health training. And to train them, provision them, supervise uh, and uh, help support them with information technology so that they can be lifesavers in their community. And... We have implemented this uh, process. It costs about $6 to $7 per person per year in the area. So it's 
part of maybe that $60 per year targeted health budget, which we can't quite achieve because we don't have the resources and the government doesn't have the resources to achieve that full coverage, we're probably at something like 40 to $50 per capita in most of the sites. And the community health workers is around six, seven, eight dollars depending on which location. It's marvelous what it can do. It's, it's unbelievable what it can do. It's bringing malaria deaths down sharply. It's spotting kids that are in very dangerous uh, situation, maybe an acute respiratory infection, maybe failure to thrive, meaning that uh, for whatever reason, uh, they're uh, deeply undernourished, perhaps stunted at an early age. It's helping mothers to uh, access uh, antenatal visits and to uh, be able to uh, arrive with a plan to get to a clinic uh, to find transport and to know the clinic and to know how to do it uh, in time for labor. Uh, it's bringing down maternal mortality. Uh, it is uh, tracking the critical first thousand days of life, so-called, from conception uh, through uh, the second year, which are is is the most uh, uh, challenging uh, time for survival and for ultimate uh, long-term physiological, uh, cognitive, uh, brain development, uh, and and so forth. And so it's a great system, and it's such an exciting system that it's being scaled up very widely, and many of the specific modalities that we are exploring in the Millennium Villages Project, such as the information technology backbone, uh, is being adopted on a much larger basis by the host governments. So that sounds good, and um, otherwise, I'd love to come to Africa sometime. And see, uh, you're welcome. You'll enjoy it. Uh, but it, the question is, is magnitudes, and I'm sure there are many, many beneficial aspects for some of the improvements that have been made in these villages. But when we come to try to measure them, it, it gets quite – it seems to be more difficult to, to make the case. So there have been two peer-reviewed articles that tried to look at stunting and child mortality – published by by you and your group, uh, the one at Lancet, the Lancet had to be corrected because there were some mistakes made, but more importantly than the mistakes, uh, the decrease in child mortality was actually less than the decreases in the neighboring countries where the clusters were located. Does that not discourage you about the impact of these efforts? Russ, it, it couldn't be further from the truth. And since you read the, the uh, book by Nina Monk, uh, you'll recall chapters uh, eight and chapters nine, which describe uh, my leadership and the role of the Millennium Villages in getting malaria deaths down, which has been the most significant success in getting child mortality down significantly in recent years in Africa. And the Millennium Villages project played an important role. And I'm very proud that I played an important role in that as well. And what we said already and what I was saying uh, already uh, back in the year 2000 and then uh, throughout the whole Millennium Development Goal uh, effort for the UN and then through the Millennium Villages Project is that it's possible to scale up these basic interventions at very low cost. And there was a huge row about doing this. I am one of the architects of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria that helped to do this scale up. I'm extraordinarily proud of that work and I'm extraordinarily pleased with how it's gone. But what happened was that uh, we now have a way to get comprehensive coverage of some of these crucial life-saving interventions. And it's funny that in uh, this book, The Idealist, Nina Monk does a a good job, actually, of uh, describing the rather uh, tough battle that I faced personally to uh, argue for the mass scale-up of malaria control. And the truth is, uh, of course, that uh, that's a battle uh, where we had a phenomenal uh, victory. And malaria, which is a very difficult to control disease, is down by about 50% now in deaths of children in Africa. It's a tremendous success of the past 13 years. Uh, And uh, she actually describes 
uh, in the book, uh, this big fight for the mass distribution of bed nets. And she writes that everyone in the business was convinced that Sachs was behind the move. He probably was. And and I was actually. It just uh, uh, is a matter of fact. And she describes the very tough battle for this. And it's worked. Uh, and so where is all this sardonic uh, attitude coming from when one sees the success of millions of kids being saved? Well, I because, don't think anybody – I don't think anybody uh, when, is – But, Russ, you'd be surprised because people are – sardonic about it and and uh, and uh, say that it's uh, all uh, terrible you even uh, said in, in your own uh, interview with her that uh, I have smashed the dreams of people uh, that uh, it's one of the cruelest things in the world to come to a group of people set their hearts on fire uh, and uh, and and then uh, it all comes crashing down and to smash it through your own hubris it's so depressing and so forth come on Russ transcripts there are a good great, thing there, isn't it Russ there are great advances that are being made people should know about them uh, without the cloud of all of this confusion uh, and Nina Monk's book concluded these two chapters by saying I'm arrogant that, that was her conclusion not that the, the lives are being saved and then in, in the true spirit of a cynic, she says, okay, let's say that universal coverage of bed nets is achieved and that as a result, the rate of malaria transmission plummets, by the way, both of which have occurred. After four or five years, insecticidal, long-lasting bed nets start to disintegrate. Unless they're replaced, transmission rates in Africa will start to rise. How likely it is, is it that in four or five years, Africans themselves will be able to afford new bed nets? Is it realistic? And so on. In other words, take a success and just make sure that it's viewed in the most negative way. Uh, I don't know whether that's cynicism or uh, just pessimism, but is the alternative that uh, the kids should have died by the millions? I don't think so. Uh, oh, I don't. This is... This, this is a way forward that is proving scaled success. We should be proud of it. We should know it. We should note it. We should learn from it. And we should build on it because it's happened at extraordinarily low cost. And it was a tough fight to get here. And then to be denigrated about dreams smashed and all the rest is not appropriate in this. We need to tell what's happened. What's happened is that despite a huge fight, about aid because there are many aid skeptics. There was a scale up of development assistance for primary health care. The Millennium Villages played an important role in that in many different fronts. This is working in terms of significant declines of mortality rates now. Well, there's two issues and um, well, let's leave uh, Nina Monk's cynicism out of it because I don't know her well. You know her better than I do, but I did not in my time interviewing her or reading her book. She didn't strike me as a cynical person. Uh, she strikes me but as – But Russ, a, I was quoting you, not her. Oh, I know. Well, you were quoted her twice. I, I, no, you, no, no, no. But were, I was quoting you as saying how cruel I am to smash the dreams of people. Well, I'll defend myself in a minute. But let's let's stick with the with the bed dead issue, which is the following, it seems to me. The first is, is that going back to the facts, the child mortality rate in the villages – where you are did not decline faster. In fact, declined more slowly. I really doubt that that's true. And we'll find out because in all of those places, uh, the uh, policies uh, included bed net distribution more widespread than in uh, in uh, just the villages Fair based enough. on based on the lessons. And Russ, Fair I'm going to tell you that's Russ, please. That is 2007 or 2008 data in that paper. We will look next year. Okay. And I can tell you that from what we're seeing, if you want to hear a, a correct assessment right now, we're seeing very significant drops of mortality rates because now community health systems, community-based delivery of uh, health care, new uh, prevention of mother-to-child transmission of AIDS, First thousand days protocols, smartphones, and other interventions are playing a major role. 
We will see. If it turns out that this is a general phenomenon, wonderful. If it is a general phenomenon, it will be in part because of the scale up that I've been championing and that we've been demonstrating in the Millennium Villages. But we will see. I don't really want to, uh, and I don't even uh, wouldn't interpret the data the way you are, talk about a 2008 data point. Let's talk about where we are right now, what we're seeing, what we're accomplishing, and then next year's evaluation will exactly address your question. Well, it, it's your paper, not mine, and it's the paper that was purporting. I know, but you're citing was, something from the beginning of a project. Yeah, Why first are five you doing years, that? First five years. But no, no, no. It's, by the way, it's not even the first five years of the project. It is, the, it is within the first five years of a five-year project, of a 10-year project, excuse me. So that's a kind of game. No, it I don't think it's really a, no, is not, time it is not justified for us. Well, I thought the Lancet article covered 2007 to 2010, which would not be yeah, the, the project w it goes from 2005 uh, five to 2015. Right. So it was an assessment. Okay. It was an assessment of it was the beginning of yeah. an assessment. And, okay. Well, we'll, we'll, well, I'm with you. I'm totally and, with and, you. And, and Russ, I'm going to say it again. What we have seen in public health in Africa, which I am very pleased to see and very proud of what this project and I also personally and the MDGs have contributed to is a significant drop of deaths because of the kinds of scaling up of primary health care that is possible right now at low cost. That is the crucial point. Yeah. And if all of Africa achieves the Millennium Development Goals, I'm going to call it the most splendid success of all, because that's really the point, how to get this scaled up. When in, Africa, when in uh, Kenya, the health minister saw what we had accomplished in uh, the one site, and she said, I'm going to do this for the whole country. And I helped her do this for the whole country. And then you get big drops of mortality everywhere. Is that a failure of the project or a success of the project, Russ? Oh, the question is, that, the question is, mean, the does question it is. That, does it mean that the impact of the project is small or does it mean that it's significant? Well, the according question, to, according to uh, my critics, it means that the impact is small because they say impact is the difference of the village from the neighboring village. That's absurd. If the impact of the project is to help the scaling up of a life-saving intervention that covers the whole country. They're interested in a statistic. I'm interested in the public health, and they're playing with words. The impact of the project was to help an Africa-wide scaling up of malaria control, both within these villages and outside the villages. I'm delighted that the progress of malaria control has been rapid outside the villages. That's the whole point of this project. So am I. I'm proud of the role that you the project be. played in this. Yep. So am I. I. I think it's exhilarating and I think it's – you should be proud of it and I'm perfectly content to give you the credit for it because I think it's – it took a massive mobilization of energy and time and wheedling and bargaining and negotiating and and it may be the single greatest thing you'll ever accomplish in your life and there's – that's glorious. But the question as an economist that we have well, to ask. I'm, I'm proud of it and, and uh, I'm be. proud of other things too. I, you, hope, well, you uh, we, be, we, I, I hope we can have many successes on many fronts. Right, be great. <laughs> this be, is a good one. It'd be great if there were more. But but the fundamental question is – I'll tell you another one, Russ, if I might, uh, just just for a moment. Not, not uh, a personal uh, success only for that point, but just to explain the real battle that we're talking about. In the year 2000, there wasn't one single – African on antiretroviral treatment with international official donor support, and only a handful in general, despite the fact that the epidemic was already infecting more than 20 million people, and they were dying without access to the most basic medicines. Now there are about 8 million on treatment because of the Global Fund, because of PEPFAR, uh, because of other programs. It works. The costs have come down tremendously. The learning curve operates. Lives are being saved. The productivity of African economies has gone up considerably. The idea that AIDS would uh, be the uh, end of Africa's development obviously has uh, long since passed. 
because the epidemic, though still serious, has turned down substantially and is on its way down. And now there are even more dramatic things that can be done in the future that are uh, really uh, exhilarating. Those were big fights also because the aid skeptics say you can't do that. No way to no way to uh, get systems working. It'll be too expensive. Can't be managed. Africans won't be adherent to, to the medicines and so forth. I've heard so much doubt over the years about the feasibility of doing basic things that are crucial for kids in school, for farmers to earn a decent income, for basic infrastructure uh, to be put in place, for uh, people to be able to stay alive. And time and again, these strategies work. And yet, maybe because they work, the frustration of those who are against this kind of approach just rises more. So the din and the noise and the confusion turns out to be extremely high. We're actually in a period where tremendous things can be accomplished on many, many fronts. And we're empowered by great breakthroughs of technology, especially information technology, which makes it possible to organize uh, efforts that were beyond organizational capacity before logistics change, uh, uh, chains and delivery mechanisms uh, and being able to track uh, aid money and uh, being able to uh, police the uh, absolute proper use of funds. Things that couldn't be done before uh, are now uh, routine because we have the capacities uh, through better technologies. Uh, we have rapid diagnostic tests that allow uh, diseases like malaria to be diagnosed, not in a clinic many miles away, but in a household and not with complicated microscopy and lab reagents, but with the drop of blood uh, on a very inexpensive uh, plastic strip that detects an antigen. And so the possibility of solving these problems for us is huge. And the skepticism that uh, and the noise and the confusion about this, unfortunately, is one of the big obstacles. OK, well, let me let me go back to this question of efficacy and effectiveness and cynicism. So I agree with you. I think the adding of bed nets and and I'm happy to give you credit that the adding of bed nets in the villages was made it easier to add them outside the villages so that a comparison of child mortality within and, and compared to out neighboring villages may not be suggestive of the real impact of the project or your efforts. But the fundamental question as an economist is not whether adding bed nets can reduce malaria and reduce child mortality. They do, and that's wonderful. The question is whether that inexpensive, as you concede, approach is superior to the integrated approach which you're selling. You're selling an idea which is very ambitious, which is much more expensive than bed nets. And the question is whether the money has been well spent and whether there's the bang for the buck. So that's the challenge. Can we distinguish between the effectiveness of a cheap, small intervention that I think everyone accepts is a good idea, assuming that it is, does persist, and the more broader, ambitious claims you're making for the project as a whole? Sure. Uh not everybody uh, accepted it uh, as a good idea uh, nine years ago. Bill Easterly uh, devoted part of uh, his first chapter of uh, White Man's Burden to uh, denouncing the idea. Uh, he said it was a, a planner's, uh, planner's dream and a practical nightmare and it couldn't work uh, and took pains to say that exactly the kind of approach that has worked wouldn't work. Uh, so. This is a, an ex post reading, uh, but at the time, uh, there was little support for it, which is why the fight was, was so hard. Uh, and I would say that that's true on many, many fronts that this project is helping to scale up, showing how community health workers can work and can work so effectively uh, has been uh, a big success of this project, which is now being taken up at national scale in the host countries. We've introduced the community education workers the same way to uh, help uh, get kids in school and help them to learn better. Uh, this is uh, another area where at very low cost, it's possible to make significant progress. 
uh, we've uh, shown how one can have distributed off-grid solar power uh, in an extremely uh, effective uh, manner on a, on a business basis, uh, prepay solar like prepay uh, phones. And this is one of the innovations uh, that is now being scaled up uh, in many countries in Africa, a project called Shared Solar that uh, the engineering team of this project uh, has helped to develop. We've uh, helped to create a number of uh, information systems uh, so that one can have uh, monthly information. It took a long time, by the way, but now that we have good connectivity, we have smartphones, we have uh, the training, the, uh, uh, the uh, programming uh, that was needed for this. Uh, also, uh, the international system is quite complicated with all the approvals and all the rest that need to be done, especially when one is handling clinical information and so forth. All of that is now in place. And that information system, uh, the host countries uh, are saying, oh, we could use that at a national level. Uh, and we're helping the Nigerian government, which is indeed a very complicated country with uh, 160 million population to have for the first time information that reaches into what are called their local government areas. Uh, we have uh, several important innovations uh, in business development, uh, especially the so-called SACOs, which are uh, community-based, very effective finance institutions. We didn't invent them by any means, but we're finding them to be a very powerful instrument for the kind of local finance that you'd really like. Uh, and that's what's uh, financing a lot of the upscaling in things like dairy and honey and sericulture and aquaculture and other things that I mentioned earlier, which are coming from the ground up, just as, as you would like. Uh, we have a massive uh, project now in digital soil mapping that emerged from the science of this project and uh, the uh, realization that improving soil fertility was a very inexpensive pathway to major increases of crop yields. It, can we talk about let's, ta let's talk about the crop Sorry. yield. Let's talk about the crop yield for a second, because sure. we talked earlier about agricultural productivity being increased in some of the areas. Uh, it's been quite dramatic. It's been twofold and threefold, which is very impressive. Uh, it's hard to understand how that's going to be a, a scalable solution, right? The uh, increases in productivity tend to lead are going to lead to lower prices. Profitability of agriculture tends to be quite quite the profit margins are quite small. It seems it's going to be difficult and challenging to get lots of farmers above subsistence, subsistence by making them more productive. Do you worry about that? Well, agricultural upgrading has been uh, a key part of economic success in every region of the world that I know of. And the basic idea is that uh, when you get the crop yields up, then a much smaller proportion of the population – has to engage in farming to feed uh, – to, to meet basic food needs. And so that so, brings me to my next question, which is uh, the the real criticism of, of Nita Monk and and my interview with her, which – and you talked about my, uh, my cynicism or sardonic nature as well as hers, is her observation that there was little sustainable transformation of, of, pro, of livelihood, of jobs – so the question to me is, and this to me is the fundamental question, uh, many of these things I think are great. They're wonderful. Whether they're cost effective is the second question, but certainly you're having an impact on people's lives during the, during the course of the project. The challenge is, is there a sustainable market? Is there a way for people to buy and sell? And what I wrote after that interview was, uh, we better ourselves by bettering others. And what a market does is it allows you to help other people by doing something that they value and they pay you for it. Do you see that happening and why didn't that appear to be happening at least to an on-site visitor in the two villages that Nina Monk was in? OK. Of course it's happening. Uh, and Russ, uh, you love markets. I love markets. Uh, and of, of course, uh, markets uh, are functioning and they function better now that there are phones, uh, now that uh, there is more electrification, now that the roads are improved because transactions costs uh, are a critical part of making markets work. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, 
markets are working uh, in rural Africa and they're working uh, in Africa more generally. And as you know, economic growth in Africa has been rising significantly. Uh, I regard that uh, as uh, a result of a number of different phenomena. Uh, one is, of course, the pull of China, which has made a big difference to uh, primary commodities prices. It's helped lift agricultural prices. It's helped uh, lift uh, other uh, uh, commodity prices uh, that Africa is uh, complementary to China uh, in uh, supplying their demand. Big gains of productivity coming from the mobile revolution, which is sweeping Africa the same way it's sweeping other parts of the world. Uh, increasing investments now in electrification and in other critical infrastructure. And I think it's worth my saying uh, uh, Though I wouldn't have thought there would have been such confusion about it, but you know, I'm a, a macroeconomist and development economist, and I've worked in about 130 countries around the world uh, at, uh, uh, at at some level or another, uh, in, or visited that number and worked in in most of them uh, in uh, in one way or another. Uh, and uh, I want to be very clear that rural development is one part of overall economic development. It's only a piece of the overall puzzle. It's not meant to be the uh, ultimate uh, solution to uh, all of the challenges of Africa. I've said constantly, though I don't think uh, necessarily Nina Monk reported it or got it exactly, that rural development has to be complemented with urban development, of course, because most of the population is going to end up being urban, not rural in the end. That's part of the goal, actually, of rural improvement. People who say that rural productivity will have people stay in the countryside have it exactly backwards for the reason you just explained. Everywhere in the world, you raise agricultural productivity. The children head to the cities. Uh, that's how it works. Uh, so we need urban uh, strategies, and I work with a number of governments on that. We need national and indeed regional infrastructure. So there are many different scales uh, and many different aspects of overall development. I am pleased that Africa, uh, the sub-Saharan region, uh, is now growing at between 5 and 6% per year, maybe 6% this year. Uh, the IMF uh, forecasts that sub-Saharan Africa will be the world's second fastest growing region. Of course, you and I know that is just the beginning of catching up growth. Uh, they ought to be the fastest growing region in the world for two or three decades to come to narrow some of these phenomenal gaps. But we see the growth starting from what was terrible at best stagnation and uh, even reversal during the period 1980 to 2000. So I see lots of good things happening. The sustainability of what's happening in the villages, well, yes, there are markets, of course, that are being formed. There are some wonderful projects, uh, or it's not even projects, it's just what you would call normal market development, what I would call normal market development, uh, that in uh, Nigeria, for example, uh, there's a uh, very strong value chains that have been developed. So there are about 4,000 farmers in the project that are part of maize and soybean, completely commercialized value chains. That's not our commercial chains. Those are buyers uh, that are buying up the, the products and just on a perfectly normal market basis. And this is, of course, what has to happen. Ethiopia, uh, to my shock, as I already uh, said it earlier, uh, is developing uh, as a sericulture uh, chain. I don't know anything about silk farming. I find it fascinating that one of the Millennium Villages is, is doing this uh, and is finding marketing links and uh, ways to sell the silk uh, to Otis and ways that the silk weaving is actually uh, finding its way to international markets. And so you're absolutely right that if this were truly an island of isolation, if this were a central plan, if this were some naive uh, experiment of, uh, of Mr. Stalin uh, or uh, so somebody like that, it would be absurd. The idea here is absolutely to help provide the basics, the basics of health, deworming, nutrition, education, 
road, basic feeder roads, because they're just feeder roads. We're not building major roads, but feeder roads, uh, water sanitation, uh, help with business organization to uh, to uh, um, uh, start uh, up uh, uh, SACOs, these uh, mutual uh, chains, or to make contacts with buyers uh, and to identify agronomic uh, limitations that can be overcome through soil nutrient improvements or, or other agricultural practices or introducing better seeds. We're not out to create an autarkic economy. You know me. I've been writing about the value of trade and markets all my career. I'm a huge believer in markets. Uh, and I know that there's no development without markets. And there's no sustainability, Russ, in Africa without urban no development and without industrial development as well. Is, so this is just a piece of this. It's the not problem, a problem. No, but it's, the problem it's is – It's not a problem. I don't, it's, I don't a piece think, of the, it's a piece of the puzzle. No, the problem is I, I don't think we know very much as economists about how to create markets. We certainly understand what they're capable of doing once they're established. We understand that they are – good economists understand that they are buttressed by culture and norms and all kinds of unobservable things that we can't seed or grow. We have to let them emerge and we don't know how to help them emerge. So I don't know. I, I don't agree with – I don't agree with that. Uh, I, I just don't agree with that. Uh, my experience has been uh, that uh, if there is a functioning port, uh, if there are roads, if there's electricity, if there's communication, uh, markets will uh, take the opportunity and people will find ways to make money. And that can happen in a number of ways. It can be some local entrepreneurship and it can be some international entrepreneurship. Last time I was uh, passing through Addis Ababa, I met a, a woman uh, who uh, from China who's exporting shoes from Addis. She said now that the transport costs to Djibouti have come down so much and now that the wages in China have gone up so much, this is a great low-cost production site for me. And she was expanding to millions of shoes. This well, is how things yeah, get – Yeah, I agree with you. So let's, yeah, come ba let's come back to this bottom-up, top-down issue we started with. If you take a group of farmers in a desperately poor village and you give them seed that makes them more productive, you change their lives, mostly for the good, I assume, uh, and it appears that it mostly was for the good in the villages where that happened. But that isn't what they chose to do on their own. I don't think they picked the kind of seed. They didn't vote. They didn't have – weren't given money to decide which kind of seed they wanted to, to, to increase the productivity, what kind of crops – and so inevitably, there are decisions that are made that are not really market decisions. And it seems to me that is going to affect the effectiveness of the project. Russ, uh, you could have said the same thing, and people did say the same thing about malaria nets. Uh, why, why are you doing this? Uh, there's a market out there, and if people really want them, let them buy them. Uh, and uh, yet, uh, more than a million uh, kids were dying of malaria. Uh, and uh, there was a solution, obviously, in sight, uh, and that solution has worked, and it has been taken up as it should be as a public health challenge, and it's and it's working. And but that's not a, that doesn't and, imply and that, been, that increasing been, that doesn't imply that increasing the productivity of maize farming is going to lead to a better life the way malaria bed nets did. It's not the same. Well, it is the same because in the African context. There has been a very specific problem, which is that the poorest of the poor have just been left to face disaster where they could not afford inputs, they could not uh, improve their soil nutrients, they could not get access to markets or seed, they didn't have agricultural extension. So this is a sector because the World Bank had decided back in 1985, basically, that uh, there shouldn't be uh, uh, almost any public role whatsoever uh, in helping some of the fundamentals, even for the, wor the world's poorest people, that what you could see in the early 2000s was a plain disaster, like the public health disaster, but this was the agriculture disaster, that yields were a tiny fraction of what they could be and a tiny fraction of the profitability of what they could be, because you know 
that when people have no collateral at all, when they are, have no knowledge of uh, what is potentially available, when there are not markets there to begin with because they uh, they don't exist and farmers can't afford even a bag of fertilizer, you have a startup problem. And throughout the world, the improvement to high yield seeds and more intensive farming has often, especially in the uh, more difficult areas, needed a kind of jump start. I'm not for that for the long term. I don't want to see farming uh, on a state run basis uh, any more than you do. But when you can see that you have a continent of impoverished smallholders who literally, despite backbreaking labor every day, could not grow enough to eat because their soils did not have enough nitrogen in them and the seeds could not support a decent crop, you have a problem. And that problem was not only festering, that had gone on for 15, 20 years of tragedy while the rest of the world was climbing in crop productivity. Agricultural productivity in Africa and grains was stuck below one ton. Now you say that we force them to do this and to do that. That is not the case. And everywhere no, you locally, chose for them. That's all I meant. It's not even so, Russ, because after the first couple of years, this quickly transitioned to issues, uh, to uh, solutions like uh, local banks and to SACOs. We don't even subsidize the fertilizer right now, except on for widows on uh, 0.1 hectare farms and so forth, where it's uh, clearly a, a, a social support policy for the rest. This is organized in, in markets. This is organized through SACOs. This is organized through cooperatives. This is organized through value chains. I don't know where the idea comes from, except for the fact that it's really important to understand, really important, that Nina Monk visited this project in the beginning stage of the project. She reported from one site, which is absolute, not even one of the 10 core sites, and I'll be happy to talk about it, but absolutely extraordinary. It's the one place in the project in a war zone, uh, in a violent zone, extraordinarily difficult, one of the harshest uh, environments you'd find anywhere in the world. And the other site, she reports an anecdote from, I think it's 2008, uh, as if that's the end of the story. And so a lot of this idea that one has about this is unfortunately what has been said again and again and again, not based on at all how the project actually works. Well, and it, well, it's I'll just let, a basic point. I'll let I'll let Nina Monk defend herself, which she, sure. she has done, and people can she will. people can read her book and listen. But Absolutely. it does raise the fundamental question that we'll close on this. We're over time, but it's worth it because I think it's such a crucial set of issues that we're talking about. So. Maybe she's wrong. Maybe maybe she misperceived things. Uh, but of course, there's a possibility that you're wrong, that you as the head of the project are not really the best judge. The challenge, and you've been criticized by a lot more people than Nina Monk, you've been criticized by a large swath of the development economics uh, folks because it's going to be very difficult in 2016 when the project comes to an end – to evaluate whether it's been successful. And I again, success isn't people's lives are better. I hope they are. I expect them to be. Usually they are. Not always. Sometimes there's really awful unintended consequences. And and those are the ones I was referring to in, in that quote you took from our transcript, which is uh, I'll, I still think is true. That if no, you, you don't. Yes, I do. If you, you encourage, really think I've smashed the dreams of the people in these villages, Russ? I think it's Do you true. think that they're unhappy right now, by the way? I have no idea. I know you don't. But you said so. I you said, said so. that I had smashed their dreams and that was the cruelest thing that I that could be done. Well, I have, Do you really think that's the case? You didn't raise that question. You asserted it, by the way. Yes. So here's how – Here's let me, let me make that uh, – let me explain why I believe that and why – or why I at least worry about it. And that was based on the evidence that, that Nina Monk gathered in her – Six years with you. So it wasn't like – She wasn't six years with me. She came on six visits of uh, roughly one per year. And by the way, she visited uh, an average of one week per year 
in the first half of a project. Okay. If you just well, we'll want to know. We'll see. The question what do you then mean, is, we'll see? Well, we'll see how it turns out. We'll I see know, how- but Russ, you said, uh, I'm sorry, uh, that uh, part of what Jeffrey Sachs does that I think is so destructive and deeply unfair is that I use a kind of emotional blackmail, blah, 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 uh, cruelly disappointed, harm the people he supposedly set out to help. No, th- sorry, that's Nina. What you had said is that uh, the cruelest thing in the world is to come to a group of people uh, to take their dream and to smash it. I think that's through true. Through my own hubris. I think it's come true. On, Russ. I think it's true that you it's think cruel. I smashed their I, dreams? I think it's cruel to smash people's dreams. I yeah, think, do you think that I've done that? Well, that's the question, isn't it? And, well, and, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Is it the question of millions of people alive today because of scaling up of these critical uh, health interventions, farmers uh, getting uh, more yields, uh, higher yields? Uh, do you think that uh, kids in school, more water supply, sanitation available, rural electrification? You could say I'm that you're there telling are better stories. ways to do no, it. You're Russ, telling, you could say, no, that, Russ, you could say there, Russ, you could say there are better ways to do it. You could say that uh, is this really cost effective, although uh, I would say that uh, $40 per capita now or $60 per capita then is uh, hardly the extravagance uh, it's been painted to be. But to say that I've smashed their dreams. Now, what I said is that I said. It is what you said. Read it again. Okay, I'll I'll read it uh, in in entire in its entirety. And yet, in many ways, and you could see the program he had had some positive effects. But in many ways, it's one of the cruelest things in the world to come to a group of people, set their hearts on fire, saying, "I'm going to change your life." There's magic coming. It's the magic of expertise and wisdom and money, and your lives are going to be different. And to take that dream, which every human being has of a better life, especially for their children, and to smash it. And through your own hubris, it's just so depressing, partly because those arguments tend to win. That's what you said. Yes. And then I it, haven't smashed their dreams. Well, I don't know if you their, have. Their kids are alive and they're staying uh, healthier and their kids are in school and they have some chances. And you can say I'm an imperfect person and it's an imperfect program and maybe uh, you could do better. That's okay. Uh, no, and I'm no. sure, that there, are, I'm sure I, that there are ways to do better, but to call this one of the cruelest things. Well, one us, of the cruelest things is to smash people's dreams. Yeah, but if you say I've smashed their dreams, I, I think that since you haven't even been once, you haven't talked to one person in a village, you haven't even been to rural Africa. To make a statement like that, you didn't say, did he? You weren't interviewing. You were making an assertion. Yeah. What's the basis of that assertion? What is even one shred of evidence for that? Well, again, if if you read the if part, which was part of it, it says if you build up people's hopes and smash those dreams, it's a very cruel thing. You're claiming you haven't done that. You're claiming what you've done is you've made their lives better. And I conceded at the beginning of the quote, and I still concede throughout this program throughout our conversation, that you've done some wonderful things in Africa. The fundamental question is, is is there, this is the question, have the lives of the next generation of the 14-year-old boy or girl in those villages, have their prospects improved? It's great that they're alive. I don't disagree with that. You know I don't. And if it's malaria bed nets that got them there, God bless them. I think that's wonderful. And God bless you for getting them there. That's wonderful. The question is, is whether the entire approach, which does promise transformation, has actually transformed. And let's close. And I would argue that if, in fact, it hasn't, and if, in fact, what you have done, even with the best of intentions, is to encourage people to believe that the intervention of outside money across a wide scale of activities is going to transform their lives, and it doesn't, that will be tragic, and it will be very sad. So the fundamental question is, what, how will we decide whether that's happened or not? How will we decide? And my, I want you to defend yourself against a different claim, which is the one we'll close with, which is many people in the developing community, the, the uh, community of development economists, have said that there is no way in 2016 that we can accurately or even begin to evaluate whether these interventions have been successful or not. And that is unfortunate. And I, you know, earlier on you said, In 2016, after the 10 years, we'll have a full picture 
what will we have a full picture of? So my last question is, who will evaluate the efficacy of that of these projects other than you? And you're, you know, I don't, I don't know you, Jeff. I think you're probably an incredibly dedicated and um, hardworking person for people who you're trying to desperately help, who desperately need help. I don't deny that. But the question is, who will evaluate what uh, information will this project provide that might lead to further um, improvements or knowledge? Well, Russ, I would start with the market test. The market test is that this project is so successful from the point of view of the governments in terms of how to deliver services and what they can learn from it and the communities that it is spreading now to more than twice as many countries as it started uh, to 21 countries right now and others that are uh, asking uh, also to be part of it. Governments are using their own funds. In order for that to have happened, there have been uh, countless visits by parliamentarians, by local officials, by experts that have said, do we want to do this? Do we want to do this in other parts of our country? And the answer has been yes. Uh, and now uh, just last week in northern Uganda, Uganda is using its own funds to expand the project into one of their dryland regions. The governments are taking up many of the key interventions. That's the point. And the interventions on malaria control have been scaled up and are saving millions of lives. The interventions on preventing mother to child transmission, the interventions on helping to ensure that people with AIDS are on treatment, the methodical approach to the first thousand days of life with uh, a uh, monitoring systems uh, and so forth are being taken up. The information systems that we're using in this project uh, that allow for uh, GIS referenced, downscaled, timely information for development planning are being taken up at national scale in a number of the countries. The integrated uh, prepaid uh, photovoltaics-based uh, electricity systems at village scale are being taken up in a number of the countries. The digital soil mapping, which is an important tool for helping farmers to be able to grow more food, and yes, of course, connect with the markets, are being taken up. And so what is important is whether some of the lessons of this, how to do things, how to make things work better, how to have an integrated uh, information system approach so that it's possible to manage a, a range of activities uh, from a, uh, a monitoring uh, and an evaluation point of view are being taken up. When we look at the picture, uh, not only of the impact of this project, but the impact of the ideas Africa-wide, I'm very optimistic uh, of course, the world uh, remains a, a very shaky and dangerous place in a lot of ways. But Africa's growth is now uh, close to 6%, maybe even 6% aggregate this year. I believe it can and should go up to 8 to 10% per year growth during the next 15-year period. It's possible even faster. There are ways to scale up the basic ideas of getting these targeted investments in basic infrastructure and rural electrification on a very large scale, and we're working with a number of governments uh, to do that in Mozambique and Ghana, in Ethiopia, and elsewhere. The idea of large-scale, targeted, very inexpensive primary health systems being scaled up is now an accepted idea. President Goodluck Jonathan of Nigeria is hosting a conference uh, shortly on universal health care coverage because now it's understood that it's possible, it's within reach to make a decisive breakthrough in what was by far the most disease-ridden continent in the world. So I'm feeling very good about Africa's prospects. No, but you're, I have the, no, fundamental, I have, the fundamental I have question no, is... I have no illusion uh, that uh, there's a, a lot of challenge ahead, that Africa remains very poor, but I can see that there are ways forward through 
absolutely integrated strategies that focus on scaling up infrastructure, healthcare, education, uh, and uh, helping that agricultural breakthrough, not so that the next generation remains in agriculture. It will mean that the next generation is in cities uh, doing something different, but uh, at least some will be behind in far more uh, productive farms. And, and that's how development works. And I believe that it's Africa's turn to have that kind of development. So how are you going to convince someone like me who is skeptical or I'll put myself in the shoes of your donors and it's important to to remember that almost all of the original money, maybe all of it, was privately donated by people who were uh, inspired by your vision. So if you came to me as a donor and said, I want to do this again in South America, um, and I as the donor said, well, how do I know that it worked? What would you be able to tell us and what, you, what do you hope you'll be able to tell us in 2016? We will be able to show – uh, what uh, tools we uh, are recommending, what we have, how they work. Uh, people uh, can buy them or they can buy the Galaxy or the iPhone, uh, the, the iPhone alternative if they want, Russ. Uh, that's how a market works. Uh, and we will have a number of tools of uh, how uh, local health systems uh, can be implemented, how digital soil maps, how uh, off-grid uh, PV-based electricity, if that's what's called for, uh, and how other aspects of uh, rural development uh, can be best implemented. These are powerful tools that uh, the what governments of the region are uh, very excited about. They've come, they've seen, they've discussed at length with the community. Uh, they've looked at how these function and they know uh, how their own systems function. That's why they're scaling up uh, community health right now. That's why they're asking for scaling up uh, the off-grid uh, solar. That's why they're asking for scaling up the information systems. Uh, they recently uh, uh, combined a number of countries, recently borrowed what is their own money from uh, the Islamic Development Bank, uh, more than $100 million to fund scale-up activities uh, in Chad, Mozambique, Sudan, uh, Djibouti, Somalia, uh, and scaling up uh, in Uganda, where uh, one of the sites is, but now there'll be another site uh, in the north. Uh, the government of Mali has uh, asked us to help them work on a integrated national plan, the government of Ethiopia the same way, the government of Rwanda the same way. Uh, that's the market test. If uh, others have better it's an tools. It's an interesting market test. It, there is some value to it. I don't deny it, right? But you're talking about governments choosing – uh, a particular set of approaches. It'd be, I would be a little more impressed maybe if, if the donors were continuing to fund it, not rather than people who can. Well, the, the, the donors funded a specific project. This project is coming to an end at the end of 2015. It will be thoroughly evaluated. We'll have the metrics. That's my will... question. Can yes. you thoroughly evaluate it? What does that possibly mean? And you've been criticized for the fact that there are many people who believe it cannot be critically evaluated. And it's not going to be independently evaluated. Is there any plans to evaluate it independently outside of your team? Yes, there is. There will be an independent team on the data collection. There is an independent expert group that is overseeing the evaluation. We are bringing in critics as well as uh, just uh, generally interested people to discuss the protocols. And so this will all be done in a completely open, transparent, and shared basis. Look you forward. can count on that. I look forward to interviewing you again in 2016. I hope we can talk about other things even before <laughs> then, because it's always fun to talk to you and with you. My guest today has been Jeffrey Sachs of Columbia University. Jeff, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Pleasure. Th thanks a lot, Russ. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.